in progress. Good, good, good. Okay. Now will that thing up top go away? Go away. Go away. There you go. It had to have the wave of the blessing to send it away. All right. But anyway, so now consider this uh, quote, and this is not from the Prologue number, from the introduction to that work I told you about, the critique of pure reason. Uh, here, Kant waxing almost poetic. He says, the light dove in free flight, cutting through the air, the resistance of which it feels, could get the idea that it could do even better in airless space. Likewise, Plato abandoned the world of the senses because it posed so many hindrances for the understanding and dared to go beyond it on the wings of the ideas in the empty space of pure understanding. He did not notice that he made no headway by his efforts, for he had no resistance, no support, as it were, by which he could stiffen himself and to which he could apply his powers in order to get his understanding off the ground. It is, however, a customary fate of human reason and speculation to finish its edifice as early as possible and only then to investigate whether the ground has been adequately prepared for it. Um, what do you think Kant means by this? Yes, sir. If, for the dove, if it was not limited, it has an idea that it can go further just by the feeling of air resistance. Right. And so if only it, it, it could fly in an airless space, yeah, then it could soar ever higher. What a marvelous analogy. Um, but what would happen to the, uh, you know, dove in uh, empty space without the resistance of the air against the wing? <laughs> right. Exactly. Well, and remember, you know, sort of thinking about, uh, you know, the basic kind of uh, physics that people like Galileo and Newton were working upon. Now, imagining that you still had something like gravity, but at the same time, you didn't have like atmospheric resistance. You would, the, the dove would just, it would fall, <laughs> right? Because what makes possible the principle of lift? Wind, air resistance, precisely. So Kant has this marvelous hero analogy where he's thinking that Plato is like the dove who, you know, wants to get to being to truth in and of itself, but feels resistance, you know, and the resistance that he feels is sensation. If only I could get beyond sensation, if only I could get beyond experience, then I can know the true nature of being itself. And of course, for Plato, it was quite literally ideas or the forms, right, which existed on a different plane and weren't accessible by sensation, but only by pure intellectual insight. But again, what Plato didn't realize, according to Kant, like the dove, is that the only thing that makes knowledge possible is experience, okay? In that sense, Kant is, you know, has that tendency toward empiricism and skepticism. But on the other hand, what is it that makes Kant Kant? Unlike the empiricists, he, hold that the, he holds that the mind is not a blank slate. The mind, in fact, has a priori intuitions and categories that exist within it, not, not learned, not gained empirically, but rather these a priori intuitions and categories are applied to sensation in order to make experience possible. Kant is basically surveying the history of philosophy and saying, look, the rationalists like Plato thought they could do away with sensation. The uh, empiricists thought that the mind played no true role in the structuring of our world. But in fact, thoughts without content are empty. Intuitions without concepts are blind. Mind needs sensation. Sensation needs mind. And only in the conjunction of those two things can you have possible experience. So Kant is alluding specifically here to that word ideas, right? Of course it was, it, it's a Greek word, it's the exact Greek word, again, perfect cognate in English, um, that he used for his forms, right? They, uh, these ideas were how Plato tried to explain the fundamental answers of things. Now Kant thinks that What Plato was trying to do 
is a fundamental capacity of the human mind or a fundamental aspect of the mind. And he calls it reason. The thing is, sensation gives us data. It gives us the, the raw data through which we're able to cognize anything, right? And again, the data, empirical intuition, passes through the medium space and time, which exist not as mind independent entities, but rather exist only where, how, in the mind, in order to make experience possible. All right. Also, the understanding takes up the objects of sensation and thinks about them, right? In order to cognize that raw sense data and to give it structure and intelligibility, to take the multitude uh, manifold uh, intuitions of you know, red, smoothness, coolness, and a kind of an apple aroma in order to unify that manifold of intuitions into a unified substance that persists through time that we call apple. It takes up the raw data and makes it intelligible. That's the structuring feature of the a priori, before experience, pure concepts of the understanding, right? So in a way, the understanding spells out experience for us, right? It, 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 it answers all the questions that we have about the empirical world. We can talk about like causality. Well, A cause B cause C cause D. And we can even trace the causality of things like the mountains in our on our earth and the rivers and where the earth came from. Well, you know, it was a piece of star that exploded one day somewhere and hurtled through a void until it got caught by another star and then other things amalgamated together and it got into a gravitational path and eventually had atmosphere and all that stuff. And you know, we you know the origin story of science. And you can say, well, what about before that? Where did that star come from? Probably other stars. Okay, well, where did the universe come from? <laughs> we call that the Big Bang. Good. All that scientific story is made possible by the human understanding, which takes up for all sense data, and it gives it a kind of an order and intelligibility and structure so that we can understand it. But you know what? The human faculty of reason says, what caused the Big Bang? Where did everything come from? What happens after I die? What about that? The human, human understanding can make sense of experience, but it cannot tell us the origin of all things. It cannot give us a complete answer to the demands of the rational mind. The rational mind seeks, as you can see under reason there, the unconditioned. What do we mean the unconditioned? Something like an unmoved mover, perhaps? Something like God, something like soul, something like the nature of the world in and of itself? Questions that human reason has in order to complete the system. To stop the question, to basically say, oh, everything makes sense. One way to think about what Kant is saying, we can understand nature, we can understand the universe, but that doesn't mean we can make sense of it. Reason wants to make sense of what it understands. One way to think about this, as Kant puts it in the very beginning of the third part of the prolegomena, he says, <clears throat> at the bottom of page 64, without solving this question, reason will never be satisfied. The ultimate question of where everything comes from, how everything works. The empirical use to which reason limits the pure understanding does not fully satisfy reason's own proper destination. Every single experience is only a part of the whole sphere of its domain, but the absolute totality of all possible experience is itself not experience. Yet it is a problem for reason. It's one thing to talk about what makes experience possible. It's another thing to ask about what is the condition of the possibility for all possible experience. Where did everything come from? Where did my mind come from? Why do we have mind? Why is there something rather than nothing? Why anything? Why this? So reason is the mental faculty that essentially leads human beings into metaphysical speculation because all the truths of science, although they may be secure and accurate, they never answer all the deepest questions, the existential questions that human beings have about the origin of them. And by the way, you can kind of see where religion would come in and basically say, it's okay, reason. 
Um, that's actually why God or uh, calls God the ideal of reason. Because what does the notion of God do? It answers every possible question that we could have. It completes our system. It makes rational the world that we try to understand. And that's what reason does. But because the questions of reason go beyond experience, reason has to postulate ideas. Borrowing that word once again from Plato and Descartes. Reason postulates ideas. And what are the ideas of pure reason? Why they're the classical metaphysical notions of things like God's soul and the world in itself. They are pure only, aka non-empirical, because reason, in order to answer the questions that it has, cannot derive its evidence from experience. But if reason is postulating these ideas without deriving them from experience, do these ideas have any force? Or is there any are there any truth to the ideas of reason? Kant's going to say, no, at least we can't prove them. What happens with the ideas of reason is that the pure concepts or pure intuitions, concepts, substance and causality, for example, intuitions, pure space and time, are applied to things in themselves. Causality and substance as pure concepts are only valid when you apply them to possible experience. We experience the book as a substance that persists through time. We say that the cue ball causes the eight ball to move. But the reason that we can talk about substances and causation is because those are the pure concepts or categories through which the mind interprets our experience of reality. Our mind conditions our experience. It gives it structure. It gives it order. It gives it necessity. That's how Kant solves Hume's problem, by saying that the necessity of causal interaction is not an objective feature of the world, but a subjective feature of the human mind. The mind gives us experience in a causally structured way because we could conceive it and understand it in no other way. So the necessity of causation is imposed onto experience by the mind, not a feature of experience within itself. But that means that these concepts are only supposed to be applied to empirical experience. But when we take the concepts and apply them to Newman or things in themselves, we get there. For example, let's talk about an infinite substance that caused all things. We're talking about substance, causality. But th do these pure concepts have any applicable validity to things outside of experience? For Kant, no. Doing so would just make the empty thoughts that he derided in that earlier quote, thoughts without content are empty. So Kant undertakes an analysis to basically try to show how through his transcendental idealism, he can prove how all the classical metaphysical debates rest upon false assumptions and thus metaphysics, as was previously taught, uh, practiced, becomes moot. Just very quickly before we move on to Nietzsche. Um, the psychological ideas, so again, ideas of reason, just to be clear, they are postulates by that third faculty that unlike, so understanding is how we cognize experience. Reason wants to go beyond mere understanding and try to complete the system, to seek the unconditioned, to answer all the questions that things like natural science cannot answer for us, the deepest questions. In order to answer that question, it postulates ideas, non-empirical ideas. They have no empirical origin. They are merely the pure concepts of the understanding applied to noumena, aka things we imagine, things that we intellectually postulate, but things that we can never prove. Kant categorizes the ideas of reason into three categories, psychological ideas, cosmological ideas, and the theological idea. As I say, there can be only one, as with I um, and of course, what is the theological idea? God, the high, the ideal of reason. <laughs> Psychological ideas, again, from the Greek suitcase, soul, they are metaphysical postulates about the existence or non-existence of the soul. Cosmological ide ideas are all about nature and causality. And of course, we've already said what the theological idea is all about. Kant goes through each one and demonstrates their, well, falsity. Now, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but I'll say that this PowerPoint is already available on Blackboard so that you can digest it if you're interested. But, you know, we might compare 
the psychological ideas to the work of Descartes. What Cox said that Descartes was doing is not like empirical psychology, but rational psychology, aka to prove the existence of the soul or mind as an independent, what's the word? Substance, right? Remember that the mind and body are separate substances, substance dualism. And as long as we say, I think, therefore I am, I have demonstrated that the essence of my being is that of thought, not body. So mind is distinct from body and it can exist without it. There you go. That's the Cartesian argument. Kant says, wait a minute. You just took the notion substance and applied it to a numinal property that you call the soul. Just because you're thinking doesn't mean you know the quote unquote substance in which your thoughts in here. You call it soul. Kant gives a really provocative and complex analysis as to the, of the nature of human consciousness to explain what he's getting at. We experience our thinking and our consciousness, but we don't necessarily experience the quote unquote substance in which our thoughts or consciousness in here, do we? I don't experience myself as brain. You know, because I can't say, well, let me see. Let me take my brain out and see my thoughts. Oh, I'm dead. All I experience is consciousness. It almost feels immaterial in a way. But, if they, but on the other hand, I can't say that therefore, since my consciousness just seems distinct from my brain, it inheres in this metaphysical soul. Look, though I would like, I do not see soul. My consciousness doesn't seem reducible to either brain nor does it seem to be applicable to some kind of independently existing soul or mind that is separate from my body. So then what, what is the I in which the thinking inheres? Descartes says, I think, therefore I am. What's the I? I feel the thinking. I don't know the I. What am I? Kant says I is like an X, X in the sense of a variable is an unknown. We cannot know our true self, whether we are merely body or whether we are souls, because it is inaccessible to us. It is human. Descartes falls into the error of applying the pure concept substance to a numinal notion such as soul, but it only has validity to make experience possible. You apply a concept outside of experience, you get what Kant calls a dialectical illusion, aka falsity. Does that mean we don't have a soul? Khan says, I don't know. Does that mean, you know, we do have a soul? I don't know. It's an object of faith and not something provable or demonstrable by reason. Remember the categories, right? Our little table here, mirroring their, this tabular structure. Khan says the cosmological ideas manifest in various forms of antinomies. That's a funny Kant word, antinomy. What does that mean? Contradictions. Rationalists can argue either side of any issue and they make no progress because they don't appeal to experience. The world has a beginning in space and time. The world is infinite. Aristotle says this, infinite universe. Descartes says this, a beginning in time because God made it that way. Remember, we have philosophers that argue either one. The universe is infinite. The universe begins in time and space. Uh, we have such a thing as free will. No, nope, no freedom, all is nature, so all is determined. What is it? <laughs> Rationally, you can prove either one. And the, one of the fun things about Kant's critique is he constructs elaborate proofs for either side, just to show how futile it is. What does Kant say? The debates are all false because they rest upon false assumptions. And here's where I can tell whether or not you're following along with Kant. Why is the first antinomy, that is the argument about whether or not the world has a beginning in time and space, why is it really the case that both sides are false? We can't measure time. Because we only You, you need not wrong. I would put it in a much more straightforward way because time and space are not mind independent entities. They do not exist apart from the human mind, so far as we know, because we can't experience that. 
The only thing we know about time and space is that they are a priori intuition through which they make experience possible. So to talk about the world in itself, beginning in time, that whole way of speaking for Kant has been turned upon it on, on its head because he says you're, you're presupposing world, time, and space to be mind-independent realities that you have access to, but you don't. So each claim is false because it rests upon false assumptions. Well, that's something interesting to say about the freedom thing. Basically, he uses his skepticism toward the nature of the soul to his benefit. He basically says, I can't say that I am determined, even though I do see that nature is determined causally according uh, to laws. But by the way, remember, what is the origin of the cause of, of the laws of nature for Kant? The human mind. So therefore, the human mind has a special relationship with regard to nature insofar as it itself seems to legislate the very laws of nature. Does that mean it is possible that the human mind is exempt from the laws of nature? Kant says it's possible. It's not something easily demonstrable, but he does think he has evidence for the freedom of the human will. And this is probably the most metaphysical that Kant gets in this particular work. He says that morality is evidence of human freedom. Kant has an interesting view about morality. He says that human beings, well, let's put it this way. Normally we think of morality as a kind of a constraint on our actions. Like for example, oh, I wanna be bad, but I gotta be good because you know, morality, the right thing to do, let your conscience be your guide. Damn Jiminy Cricket, Pinocchio, classic, right? But anyway, Kant says morality isn't a constraint on human freedom. It is the condition for the possibility of human freedom. Because if we just followed our pleasure, our desire to do what makes us happy or feel good, aren't we just following the dictates of nature? Because our physiology wants to feel happiness, pleasure, and contentment. But sometimes we do things even if it doesn't feel good. Sometimes I have to be honest, even it would be easier to lie. But I say, I have to tell the truth because it's the right thing to do. Even though it would be easier to, you know, cheat somebody right now, I have to do the right thing. Kant says, there you go. Insofar as human beings have the ability to, to act outside the demands of what he calls inclination, AKA our inclination to happiness and pleasure, which is the physiology, the part of nature that we inhabit. Human beings have the ability to not just follow the laws of nature, but to create their own laws. Self legislation. And if you recall at the beginning of our lecture, what did I use as a synonym for self legislation? Kant's favorite word, autonomy. If human beings can create laws for themselves, AKA the laws of morality, then human beings must have some form of freedom. So it, it turns out that whereas both of these theses are false because of their false assumptions, both of these theses, that is under category three, that there is freedom and that there is no freedom are both true. With regard to nature, there is no freedom. It's all causally determined. But, with, but of course, causality is a condition that's possible only through our mind. And there is freedom for human beings because we are something more than nature. We give laws to nature and we give laws to ourselves. The moral law for Kant. And he has a whole thing on morality. Actually, much of his work after the critique was devoted to excavating morality because he thought that that should be the proper destination of reason and not pie in the sky forms and things like that. Philosophy takes a practical term for Kant. Lastly, really quickly, Kant says, look, you know, God's all well and good, maybe he exists, maybe he doesn't. Actually, Kant kind of believes in God, but he says it's improvable. And he refutes the most famous argument for God's existence, the one that we saw in Meditation 5, the ontological argument. Quick recap, God exists by virtue of God's essence, since it is more perfect to exist than not exist, if God is absolutely perfect, 
then God's essence must contain um, existence. I'm actually teaching this, the original version from Anselm in my medieval class at 1230. So we're talking about good old Anselm and his ontological argument. Kant famously, actually the, the term ontological argument that we give Anselm's argument, Kant coined that term. And, and, and so the part of Kant's legacy is, is naming this argument. But Kant says Anselm can't do that. Descartes can't do that. Because he says existence is not a possible predicate. Now remember analytic judgments? Judgments where the predicate is contained within the concept, like unmarriedness is contained within bachelorhood. The essence of the ontological argument is to try to make existence an analytical predicate of God. But existence is not a predicable quality analytically. That's a complex way of saying you can't tack on existence to any definition. Why? Turns out existence is a category of human understanding and the pure concepts of understanding only have validity and applicability to what? That would be like what a rationalist would say. So no, they don't, and that would be what the ideas of reason claim that we can use the mind by itself to get knowledge. But Kant says that the pure concepts of the understanding only have applicability to possible experience. So to talk about something whose essence is existence, it's nonsensical. It's something you can believe, but it's not demonstrable by virtue of pure reason. Thus ends Kant's master <laughs> analysis of, uh, well, just about everything. <laughs> uh, and of course, we recall, I won't read this whole thing, but uh, I had to deny knowledge in order to make room for faith. But it is important to note that Kant does think that it is rationally justifiable to believe in God. It's not something ridiculous. Like I use the example of the flying spaghetti monster. Like a lot of atheist types would say, you know, well, you may as well believe in this flying spaghetti monster. It makes about as much sense as God. I don't know. Maybe that's true. But Kant would say absolutely not. Kant. God isn't something absurd. As a matter of fact, remember how Kant says that there is such a thing as human freedom and there is such a thing as human morality? Kant thinks that God is not something you can prove, but it is a postulate, almost like a mathematical interpretation of God. What is a postulate? An assumption, an assumption to make sense of something. Kant believes that morality and freedom only really make sense if there is a higher power that exists beyond nature. And he calls that God. He says, I'm not proving that God exists because it's impossible to prove rationally like a rationalist would do, but it's something that I think that we are justified to believe in on the basis of human freedom and human morality. So he tries to make science and religion and philosophy all mutually harmonious and non-contradictory. So that's what Kant tried to do. There you go. All right, finally, done with Kant. Any questions about any of that or comments? I'd love to talk more about it. It'd be fun to, you know, take it apart a little bit more, but eh, don't have time. <laughs> um, but I hope that you can see the grandiosity in Kant's thinking. Um, it's pretty powerful. Now we have to move on, though, and talk about Nietzsche, at least talk a little bit about Nietzsche today. Um, Nietzsche's very different than Kant. But then again, he's kind of, I like to think of him as like, inheriting the legacy that Kant left behind, even though he's very, very, very different than Kant. I bought new markers because I was so frustrated with all these dead markers and I left them at home today. Yeah, so they're in Lexington right now. So, now oh, this one's not bad. So after all that Kant, it's almost like at this point, what in the world does philosophy have left to do? <laughs> oh, are those good markers? Yeah, I really? Thank you. You're very kind. <laughs> I appreciate that. 
Oh, you've had them. <laughs> you, you, you've had them uh, too long, I'm afraid, it seems like. <laughs> That's happened to me. I've kept markers too long, and you know what happens? They dry up and dry up. <laughs> and you will never use them again. <laughs> it goes to show that these things do not have an infinite shelf life. So. But anyway, so Nietzsche kind of takes us all the way up to the end of the 19th century, um, you know, at the dawn of the 20th century. So now, you know, we're really just a little over 100 years ago, which in philosophy time is relatively recent. But, you know, the thing is, is even though even Nietzsche may seem like someone, you know, again, oh, man, it's, it's still really, really long ago. I wish we could do something more recent. Well, to understand, like, why Nietzsche is actually pretty recent, you have to think a little bit about Nietzsche's scholarship. You know, when Nietzsche was writing in, 18, in the 1880s, no one was reading him. No one. As a matter of fact, Nietzsche was so desperate that he began to put up his own meager um, uh, pension from, the, from his university because he had to retire early due to the fact of his very, very poor health. Um, and he received about um, a third of his salary as a pension that he tried to live on. And he didn't have a lot of money. But he used what little money he has to, to self-publish his works because publishers wouldn't publish them because nobody was buying his works. By the time that Nietzsche went and met in 1889, indeed, Nietzsche, we're not really sure what happened to him. The prevailing theory for most of uh, the last hundred years is that uh, he had uh, neurosyphilis uh, that had progressed to the point of literal you know, brain damage and, and he lost his mind. I have reasons to believe that that is not the best theory for numerous reasons. Number one, I mean, Nietzsche never really was with women. It's not to say that I don't think he liked them. It's just that, I mean, he, you know, he was kind of a loner, you know? <laughs> he, he, um, there's one story where he went to a brothel once when he was like basically a graduate student. But if that's the one time you got syphilis, like, you know, like, well, that's a bummer. Yeah, yeah I had sex <laughs> once in my life. Oh, venereal disease. <laughs> um, I, I honestly think it had to be, uh, it might be something genetic. Uh, his father, actually, when Nietzsche was about five years old, who, and his father was a pastor, um, interestingly enough, as was his grandfather and much of his other extended family, where they were all Lutheran pastors. But his father died of what was called softening of the brain at the time. Now, we must remember, this was in the 1840s, so they didn't quite know what he had. They just called it softening of the brain. So it could be a genetic condition. It could have been a tumor. It's hard to say uh, what actually happened, but uh, Nietzsche's short life was very, very productive. But going back to what I was saying earlier, in 1889, he was just a relatively obscure figure, but partly due to the fact that, um, well, university professors had been to discover his work and began teaching it. Also due to the fact that nobody loves anything more than a nice romantic story, the mad philosopher, you know, so, you know, part of his works began to gain traction. And it only took about 10 to 20 years after he died that Nietzsche became in a sensation. And in Europe, he was quite popular, but his popularity began to wane, particularly outside of Germany, because during this time, uh, the 1920s and 30s, Nietzsche's work began to be appropriated by the Nazi movement. Yes, because, well, there's a lot of reasons for that. Nietzsche had a younger sister named Elizabeth Furster Nietzsche. She married a um, sort of an anti-Semitic activist, and she even went with him to South America um, in uh, Paraguay to found a colony, Nueva Germania, which was an early Aryan colony. They basically wanted to found a colony in a different part of the world and make like a utopian Aryan society. It failed. They ended up starving, and uh, the uh, husband of Nietzsche's sister, Bernard Furster, ended up shooting himself. <laughs> you know? um, or maybe he poisoned himself. I mean, he committed suicide. Elizabeth comes back. She came back during the last decade of Nietzsche's life. He was already mad. She took over his literary estate, and she basically tried to sell Nietzsche on the grounds that he was, in fact, anti-Semitic, proto-fascist. And, uh, you know, adhere to these ideas that were gaining popularity. But in fact, neither of those things are true about Nietzsche. Nietzsche hated anything like nationalism, you know, and he, and he particularly hated anti-Semitism. 
So how is it that these things can even happen, that he could get appropriated? Well, for one thing, the Nazis were eager to find any kind of philosopher that could give some sort of intellectual justification to their cause. As you may have noticed, Nietzsche writes in a very literary, almost poetic style. And the thing about highly literary, metaphorical, poetic style is that, much like how people do with the Bible, you can interpret it in a ton of different ways if you don't sit down and read the thing from cover to cover, right? So Nietzschean ideas like the will to power, the ubermensch, or the superman, um, were appropriated by the Nazis to say that, well, what he's really talking about is like a superior Aryan race. But as I hope to show, that that is not the case. But as a result, Nietzsche's popularity waned, and he became known, especially in the English-speaking world, as virtually a Nazi philosopher. It wasn't until the work of people like Walter Kaufman, a, a scholar and himself actually uh, Jewish and um, a... Uh, immigrant from Germany who came over to study at Princeton during the World War II. And he spent his time translating and, and basically uh, publishing about Nietzsche to basically say, look, everybody's got this guy wrong. This was the result of a giant campaign, like as a result of his sister who was anti-Semitic and was trying to make money off Nietzsche's works. And Germany, which wanted to find some sort of intellectual heir, you know, some sort of support for their, you know, ideal for their ideology, and um, it was successful. So really, Nietzsche became popular during the 1950s and 60s. So even though Nietzsche is older, it has only really been in the last 60 or 70 years that people began to really read him and take him seriously. So you know, Nietzsche is not that far away. But people who did read him and take him seriously include people like Sigmund Freud, for example. Um, um, very, very influential. M much of what is known as postmodern philosophy has been taken from uh, Nietzsche, not to mention existentialism as a 20th century philosophical movement. People like Jean-Paul Sartre, Martin Heidegger, Albert Camus, all, Franz Kafka, all were huge into Nietzsche. So if there's one person that you could say has had a tremendous influence over the past 100 years of intellectual thinking, it would be this guy. Why? Well, you know, a little bit about Nietzsche. So, you know, he had a pretty normal childhood. His father died when he was young, and his father was a pastor. He lived in a parsonage. He was raised by his mom. And, uh, he, of course, he also had his younger sister, and, and also to help raise him, two older, sort of very religious, uptight aunts. So he lived in a house full of estrogen, in other words. And, um, and, you know, it may have been a little bit rough because it was a particularly religiously strict household. When Nietzsche was about 14, he went to one of the best, like, sort of private schools that was around, Schulforta, and that kind of school in those days would have trained him in things like Latin and Greek, and he would have read all of the classics, the older stuff, you know, it wasn't so much a STEM thing in those days as it was read the classics and learn the classic languages. Nietzsche ended up going into philology. What in the world is philology? Well, it's basically like the modern university's classics department, okay? Nietzsche had a proclivity for those ancient languages and he became fluent in Latin and Greek. Um, he also happened to be fluent in French and Italian as well. So <laughs> Nietzsche you know, was a pretty uh, good linguist and that proclivity to language uh, you can see come across in his um, writings. Except, um, and, and, and actually uh, Nietzsche ended up becoming chair of philology at Basel University in Switzerland when he was only 24 years old. As a matter of fact, he, they, they didn't even give him an exam for his doctorate because he had applied to this position and got it. And so they just waived the examination and gave him the doctorate because they were like, man, you deserve it, you're smart. So he was the youngest appointment to the chair of philology at Basel, Switzerland. While he was there, he ended up coming across a philosopher named Schopenhauer. And if we had more time, I would definitely like to spend a few days on this guy, but unfortunately we don't. Schopenhauer was kind of like a weird Kantian. So Kant, of course, hugely influential, right? And we also should mention important other thinkers that were um, occurring you know, during the time of Nietzsche, people like Marx, for example, um, who, obviously does his class analysis of history, but one of the most important things that Marx was advocating for is materialism. Basically, anti-metaphysical, we ought to focus upon not things in the other world, but rather the material conditions in which we live. And that's why he focused on economic and social analyses. Marx famously said, 
Philosophers have always interpreted the world in various ways, but the point is to change it in a very, very, you know, sort of, yeah, kind of thing uh, that, you know, Marx was famous for saying. But also, I mean, let's not forget Darwin. You know, Darwin was hugely decisive during this period of time. Schopenhauer was a little bit earlier than these guys, but Schopenhauer was really into Kant, and he was also interested in Eastern philosophy. Eastern philosophy, is that a thing? Of course. We unfortunately didn't have time to incorporate it in our brief little survey. But, you know, Buddhism goes all the way back to the time of, well, it would have been contemporaneous with Socrates, except it wasn't on that part of the world. It originated in India, right? Um, and also came up around the same time of uh, 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 Hinduism, although Hinduism predates Buddhism for several hundred years. Though. Anyway, Schopenhauer was studying all this stuff, and he basically thought that he had cracked the code to Kant's noumena. Remember how Kant said that, that the world in itself is unknowable? Well, Schopenhauer says, I know what it is, we know what it is, because it manifests within our consciousness in one word. Will. Schopenhauer interpreted the basic fundamental force of reality as like a, a kind of a metaphysical will to live. It's kind of hard to imagine, but just imagine that like every the world that we perceive, right, the material world in which there's individual objects and living things is merely a kind of result of a kind of a metaphysical force that literally kind of manifests itself into a kind of a physical version. You see how it's got a kind of a weird Plato element to it? There's like the real world, and then there's the world that we see. And the real world is like a unified metaphysical force, but that force is just known as will, striving, desire. And that desire manifests itself in living beings, because what is the fundamental desire of all living beings? To live. And of course, you know, in a kind of a naughty way, Schopenhauer basically says that the, you know, the most fundamental manifestation of that drive in, you know, human beings is, of course, the drive of sexuality. And that, you know, basically most of our uh, psychological drives can be reducible to very various formations of sexual drives, anticipating Freud in the 20th century. Okay, but anyway, the idea is that, you know, we 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 are characterized in our experience by desire. Right? And Buddhism actually says a similar thing, that the origin of human suffering is desire. Dukkha in the Sanskrit. So all human suffering, all the ills of the world is, is, is brought about by human desiring. And that's why um, Buddhism teaches that the way to reach nirvana or, you know, some kind of enlightenment or blessedness is to try to eradicate desire. Right? The more that you can, you know, get rid of your desire, the more that you can, um, you know, ultimately be happy and complete. Of course, not the kind of happiness that is like, you know, party kind of happiness, because that would be getting into desire, but literally the eradication of desire more generally. Schopenhauer was more pessimistic. He kind of thought that there was no hope for human beings, that we just live in this kind of world of suffering brought about by human desire. And even if you satiate or eradicate desire, you're just left with boredom. So human beings just exist in this kind of pendulum of either desiring and suffering or just absolute boredom. And, and, and really, the, the nature of our fundamental existence is, I mean, so clearly there's no God in this picture. It's just an irrational will that manifests in life. It is, a, it is an existence that is characterized by its overt pessimism. Life stinks for Schopenhauer. And he says the only happiness that we can find is through what he calls aesthetic uh, experiences, AKA through art. You know, Schopenhauer says, you know, that's why like art is so great because for a moment we can take ourselves away from our desires and the suffering of the world and just sort of immerse ourselves in an aesthetic moment, whether it be visual arts, but you know what Schopenhauer said was the greatest art that, that satiates the will and allows us to sort of get uh, just a, a moment of what kind of like what the uh, Buddhists called nirvana. Music, baby. Schopenhauer was the first uh, philosopher, as well as uh, a philosopher that wrote about aesthetics, the nature of like, you know, art and beauty. He was the first uh, philosopher to take art seriously. And by the way, it's kind of important to note that Schopenhauer 
was really only um, a little bit younger than people like Beethoven. You know, so Schopenhauer, it may also be obvious that, you know, he's, he was part of a time in European, particularly German culture, that was romanticism. You know, so you can kind of tell his whole philosophy is very romantic. And of course, that was the period during which we have some of the greatest, like, you know, classical music that was flourishing during the time. Well, Schopenhauer said, yeah, you know, you immerse yourself in music, you lose what he calls your individuality, and you become one with the will. Because he says music is the language of the will that comes into the visible realm. So because, you know, it has no, like, literal, like, verb noun like letter but it is it is a language though and it is the language of reality itself creeping through of uh, our visual or physical world and as such you become unified because remember the whole will thing is one thing it is one force and it becomes multifaceted in the physical world all right so i'm really giving all this to give you a sense of background schopenhauer basically says that life is terrible um, it is a pendulum between suffering and boredom, all brought about by desire, and desire can never truly be satiated except for the select few, like monks and ascetics, who could actually achieve this kind of thing. So Schopenhauer is basically giving a value judgment on the nature of existence. It's bad, and it's also meaningless. Schopenhauer is basically suggesting a version of nihilism. That, well, I guess there is a kind of meaning, but that meaning is just an irrational will to live. <laughs> so really, you know, Schopenhauer would advocate the ancient Greek wisdom of Salinas. Salinas was an ancient, uh, well, well it's, a, it's a mythical satyr, you know, the satyrs, right? They're the companions of Dionysus. Some people say they have like goat legs, but the Greeks didn't really believe that. That was a later Roman thing. But anyway, they were companions of Dionysus, the god of like theater and wine. And they all just kind of got drunk and hung out and, you know, played pan flute and things like that. Well, Salinas one time said to King Midas and said, you know, want to know that the, what the meaning of life is, the secret to life? It's better to have never been born. And if you are born, then it's best to get out as quickly as you can. <laughs> Boom. It is dark. And that's exactly what Schopenhauer thought. Of course, he didn't take his own advice and ended up living to a bright old age. Um, uh, <laughs> where Schopenhauer was also wealthy and well off. <laughs> Famously, his, his office had a portrait of Kant, a statue of Buddha, and he had a little poodle at his feet. So, <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> yeah. He was a weird, he was a weird and cool guy. So, so young Nietzsche, when he is a professor in philology at Basel, goes literally into a bookstore, finds this weird book by this guy, reads it, and changes his life. Nietzsche was never really that into philosophy as philosophy. He was into classics. He knew about like Plato and Aristotle and the pre-Socratic philosophers, but it was Schopenhauer that turned him on to philosophy, and he got really like metal and dark really quickly. Um, but he one thing about Schopenhauer that bothered him was this value judgment on the nature of existence. In many ways, Nietzsche took takes for granted. And this is an important point because a lot of people misunderstand Nietzsche on this point. Nietzsche does take for granted, let's call it nihilism. You know, he thinks that people like Kant and Schopenhauer have ultimately philosophically demonstrated that there is no higher meaning to existence than human meaning that we project onto existence. Think about how that's a weird just sort of twist on the Kant view of things. Remember, our, our experience for Kant is made possible by human mental categories that structure and organize all of our experience. So Nietzsche just comes along and says, but doesn't that just mean that all the meaning that we have about things in the world is just a projection of human meaning? But doesn't that mean that there's no inherent meaning within existence? So doesn't that mean that existence is just inherently meaningless? And that's what nihilism is from the Latin nihilo, nothingness. Nothing means anything. Everything is just value neutral. This is what Nietzsche means by the death of God. I'll talk more about this next time, but I just want to go ahead and point out that, you know, for Nietzsche, when he is using that term, God is dead, okay, God is tot, he's basically saying, look, all the things that human beings believed up to recent years, as, as a result of 
philosophical and scientific analysis, it no longer has the same meaning for us as it once did. It's less a claim about the truth or falsity of the existence of God, and it's more about a cultural diagnosis about the state of the modern human condition, that we once were sort of united behind a notion. And he was think he's thinking about Europe, of course, you know, he's, he's, he's focused upon that. I mean, we talk about other parts of the world, but he's thinking about, you know, modern Europe and, of course, America is kind of an extension of Europe in a sense, the Western world culture, right? We were once all united under this notion that, look, man, there is a higher purpose to things. And he's thinking about way back, the Middle Ages, prior to that detrimental Copernican revolution, where it turned out that we weren't the center of the universe, but in fact, we are just one more rock hurtling through an infinite void. After that, and the Enlightenment, and evolution, and all these socio-cultural analyses by people like, you know, Marx and Engels and Feuerbach and all of those German intellectuals. And it's just sort of like we have been shaken to the core with regard to our beliefs. And you might say, well, people still believe. I mean, Nietzsche was wrong. Look at all the people that go to church today. And Nietzsche would say, well, oh, yeah, they go to church. But does God really occupy a central role in our lives to the extent that it once did? Before uh, Nietzsche formulates the death of God, in an earlier work called Daybreak, um, or Dawn of Day, as it's sometimes translated, I included this in the first Nietzsche handout. And um, <laughs> so even before he says God, God is dead, in this work from about a year before the gay science, where he actually formulates that thought, in section 91, or excuse me, 92, um, he has a section that's called At the Deathbed of Christianity. Really active people are now inwardly without Christianity, and the most moderate and reflective people of the intellectual middle class now possess only an adapted, that is to say, marvelously simplified Christianity. A God who, in his love, arranges everything in a manner that, in the end, will be best for us. A God who gives to us and takes from us our virtue and our happiness, so that as a whole, all is meet and fit, and there is no reason for us to take life sadly, let alone exclaim against it. In short... Resignation and modest demands elevated to Godhead. That is the best and most vital thing that still remains of Christianity. But one should notice that Christianity has thus crossed over into a gentle moralism. It is not so much God, freedom, and immortality that have remained as benevolence and decency of disposition, and the belief that in the whole universe too, benevolence and, benevolence and decency of disposition will prevail. It is the euthanasia of Christianity. What does he mean by all that? What does he mean by all that? Christianity has been simplified further and further as time goes on. Yeah. So it's needed. It's complete. Mm -hmm. You know, one of my favorite little things, and I don't, you know, mean to step on any toes, but, you know, like, I always find it interesting that, like, you know, not only are there so many denominations of Christianity, but even within those denominations, it's almost like every single individual has their own interpretation of what they think that denomination and what the Bible means, right? You know, and of course, you know, Luther, that goes back to Luther, right? But, you know, aside from that, it's sort of like, well, you know, I don't think God would like that. And I'm kind of like, well, I mean, are you sure about that? I mean, how do you know God would like that? I mean, you, you got him on speaker? You got him on speed bell? Like, yeah. <laughs> the idea is it becomes all very personal. And at the end of the day, it all becomes very subjective. And if it all becomes personal and subjective, it almost seems like the force is kind of taken out, the force of belief. Well, you know, yeah, it occupies two hours of a lot of middle-class people's days once a week. But after that, I mean, is it really something you're thinking about? Nietzsche would say, look, if you're taking seriously all this stuff, it's kind of like your immortal soul is constantly in danger of eternal hell. And, I, you know, it's almost like if most people took Christianity seriously, they'd all become monks. <laughs> but we don't. We live our lives however we want to, and that's just pretty much it. And he calls it euthanasia of Christianity because it's not like a slaughter, but it's a slow death, a good death. Actually, the word euthanasia comes from the Greek, good death. But anyway, so, so again, it is a cultural diagnosis. But here's the thing. Nietzsche thinks that while, of course, people like himself, clearly a non-believer, is kind of like, well, you know, fine, that's good. You know, like, all right. He's thinking that this is, opens up a kind of a question mark for human culture. Because Nietzsche thinks that, well, wait a minute. Isn't it interesting 
that if you think about it, it's not just Christianity, but what about philosophy too? Because what is the, what is the very foundation of Western philosophy as we've been studying it all the way from Plato to Kant? That there is this dual world approach to reality. There is the world that we perceive and the world as it is in itself, whether it be Platonic forms, Aristotelian pure actuality, or Cartesian infinite substance in mind, or Kantian, Kant has his own version of this too, the noumena. And the idea is one side is better than the other side. Everything that is physical and sensory and emotional is all no good, no go, bad. And everything that is mind, heaven, God, noumena, form, substance, it's good. Nietzsche calls Christianity Platonism for the people. It's just dual world metaphysical philosophy filtered through a popular religion. And this isn't the result of some kind of conspiracy. You know, this isn't like, you know, the powers that be have manipulated things this way. It's just the legacy of the Western world. It is just, you know, sort of our cultural history. But Nietzsche says, but if this is true, whether you be an intellectual type that thinks that there's something on the other side that ultimately gives meaning to this existence, or you think that there's a God that gives a kind of purpose and meaning to this existence, if as a result of the Copernican Revolution, the Enlightenment, evolutionary biology, and all the other cultural things that have shook the core beliefs of modern humanity. If it is the case that this, let's call it constellation of belief, becomes no longer believable, thinking like God, not, not, it's not that we don't believe in death, not we don't believe in God. If it is the case that we no longer believe in these kind of things, isn't it the case that we kind of got accustomed to the notion that there has to be something more or something beyond this existence in order to make sense of it? But if it's the case that God has died and hasn't left a successor, then what is it that might await even in humanity? Nihilism. The belief that all is meaningless and all is pointless. This is what Nietzsche thinks is the modern human condition. That in the wake of the death of God, we are facing nihilism and pessimism. Is life even worth living? Is the wisdom of Salinas sounding pretty good to us right now? <laughs> Better to never have been born, and if so, to die quickly. But Nietzsche says, in fact, this offers an opportunity for, uh, for uh, reimagining. Nietzsche wants to know if we do exist in a meaningless world or existence, is it possible to give meaning to a meaningless existence? The thing is, is that for Nietzsche, human beings have been constructing meanings out of their blank canvas of existence all the way going back to Plato and before that. But we didn't realize that all the meaning we had given to this existence is a human constructed meaning. We assumed that the meaning of existence was transcendent, objective, from another world, from a transcendent God. What the death of God signifies for Nietzsche is that human beings have begun to recognize that all of the beliefs that they had are nothing more than human constructed belief. But what that means is that lacking the force of objectivity and transcendence, human beings are sliding into a kind of nihilism, no longer caring about anything, no longer finding meaning and purpose in existence. But Nietzsche wants to suggest, wait a minute, can we construct a meaning out of a meaningless existence and yet believe in it and want to live in it with the same force that we once took from the beliefs that we thought we're otherworldly. Can we construct a meaning and find the same satisfaction within existence that we once found from things like God or otherworldliness, whether it be, again, the Jewish or Christian God or, uh, you know, the Platonic, Cartesian, rationalistic second world that gives us some kind of meaning? That is, in many ways, uh, Nietzsche's uh, question. 
Um, we only got a couple of minutes left, so there's not really much I can do um, other than say, you know, the thing that I really want to talk about next time, and I'm going to come back again and again to that first handout, okay? And then I'm basically going to refer to the other handouts in a kind of a supplementary form, all right? With Nietzsche, it's not going to be so much a sequential thing as I'm going to be jumping around quite a bit with all the handouts, all right? Because with Nietzsche's thought, as you can see, it's not necessarily ordered sequentially. That doesn't mean that it's random. It just means that he has an interesting way of presenting his ideas. But what I want you to focus on, what I want to focus on next time, is this first aphorism from The Gay Science. Page 73 from the handout. It's actually, and not literally 73, but, you know, as marked on the book 73. You can find it here, right? The Gay Science 73. The Teachers of the Purpose of Existence. Nietzsche is giving us an interesting and fascinating way of thinking about sort of, let's call it this problem. How could we make meaning out of a meaningless world? What does the death of God mean for us? What is the human condition? What has philosophy, where has philosophy left us? And notice that very title, the teachers of the purpose of existence. Who would that be? Who would be a teacher of the purpose of existence? Priests, philosophers, moralists. Notice how he's lumping together philosophers, religious leaders, because they're all interested in trying to do one thing. Give us a kind of meaning. Give us a kind of structure. And Nietzsche wants to know, what is the purpose of a teacher of a purpose of existence? <laughs> what function do they serve in human existence? Do human beings need a purpose in order to live and thrive? You can kind of see that Nietzsche post Kant here, post Darwin, is moving away from a kind of a metaphysical focus that we've seen so many of the other philosophers to have to something more existential. That's why Nietzsche is considered an early existentialist. Nietzsche is not so much just interested in being as this intangible thing that exists apart from human knowing, right? You know, like God or substance. But he's interested in being as human existing. What does it mean to be a human being, particularly if we find ourselves in a fundamentally meaningless world in the wake of the death of God? That is the kind of thing that Nietzsche is trying to focus upon. All right, we'll have two more days to talk about that next week. Um, I'll see you guys. Hmm.